Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to the March 2023 CTSS quiz. Glad to have you all here, and for the occasion, I've come up with 10 terrific cases. Let's take a look at the cases, and let's see how well you do. In this case, uh, in this patient with shortness of breath, what's the best diagnosis? Well, when you look at the axials and you look at the coronal views, you can see very nicely these ground glass infiltrates with their bronchograms. There are no pleural effusion. There's essentially no bronchiectasis. There is maybe a tiny node in the right hilar region, but there's no adenopathy of significance. It looks like an infectious etiology. So, Pneumocystis, usually you have a good history, patients are immunosuppressed, IV drug abuse, but they're typically perihilar, ground glass, not this appearance. Lymphoma, again, I don't see bulky notes to suggest lymphoma. You can get lymphomas infiltrate in the lung, but it's kind of from a perihilar distribution, which this isn't. TB can give you infection, it's typically more upper lobe, usually not bilateral, usually not this type of um, airspace filling. COVID-19 pneumonia. Infiltrates best seen mid to lower lung fields so it can involve any part of the lung. Air bronchograms, ground glass infiltrates. This was COVID-19 pneumonia. In this patient with hematuria, the most likely diagnosis is, well, in looking at the axial and looking at the coronal views, there's a mass at about 5 o'clock, kind of near the left UV junction. It's enhancing. So you got to say to yourself, what could this be? Remember, we do make the point that if something's enhancing in the bladder, and I have a feeling this is, it's a bladder cancer. It's a TCC till proven otherwise. We pick up lots of incidental bladder cancers, particularly as we do arterial phase imaging. This case is arterial, and often it's in patients where we're looking at the vasculature. We give water to distend the bladder typically for our protocols, and then give IV contrast. And although bladder cancer is not something you think about as hypervascular, it does enhance to 70 to 90 Hounsfield units. And against urine, which is 0 to 10, it stands out very nicely. Now, the fact is this could be a blood clot only because any filling defect can be a blood clot. But blood clots are usually not dense, so I don't like that. A non-opaque stone, theoretically possible, but this is not a non-opaque stone by appearance. A bladder papilloma, I guess there is such a thing. I kind of made that up to give four answers. But bottom line is mass in the bladder, it's enhancing. It's going to be a bladder cancer until proven otherwise. And this was a bladder cancer. In this patient with a partial nephrectomy and hematuria, the most likely diagnosis is, well, without looking at the images, the question, of course, would be, was this a recent partial nephrectomy or was it distant? If it was a couple of years ago, then the first thing I'm thinking about is local recurrence. If it's recent, then I'm thinking of some sort of complication. Complications from partial nephrectomies include aneurysms and pseudoaneurysms, includes hematomas, it includes um, patchy areas of infarction, depending where in relationship the tumor was to blood vessels, and any of those complications. The one thing you can see here, now let's look at the images, axial and particularly well seen on the MIP coronal, there's basically AV shunting. You can see marked vascularity at the site of the partial nephrectomy. This is not a normal post-operative appearance, and it's not tumor recurrence. You can say, well, how do you know they did the whole uh, tumor resection at the right time? Maybe they missed it. I guess that's theoretically possible, but the AV shunting really is pushing for a complication. It's not the appearance of infarct, infarct. There's decreased blood flow, usually wedge shape. This is a pseudoaneurysm at the resection site. We don't see it all that commonly, but it does occur. One of the things we always comment on is if you're doing partial nephrectomy, follow-ups, you need IV contrast, because vascular complications are one of the things you look for. In this HIV patient with weight loss, the least likely diagnosis is, well, what am I looking at? I'm looking at a big spleen with a complex cystic and solid mass 
and multiple cystic and solid liver lesions. There were also periodic adenopathy. In looking at this case, liver and spleen and nodes, the thing that comes to mind, and in fact the correct answer was lymphoma. Kaposi's sarcoma is a good one for the splenic lesion, and the truth is Kaposi's can have liver and spleen, so it's a possibility. Angiosarcomas can occur in the spleen, they can occur in the liver, but they're typically hypervascular. They're not cystic, so angiosarc would not be a good thought here. Uh, but it's possible, but it's surely a better thought than reading this as a complex splenic cyst. I guess in theory it is complex, but complex splenic cyst means you're thinking about a benign lesion. This is solid, it's cystic, it's irregular borders, there are liver lesions, there's nodes. you got to be thinking about malignancy. So the least likely thing to me is a complex splenic cyst, which this is not. The most likely would be lymphoma, which this was although Kaposi's is a close number two, depending on clinical history. And in theory, angiosarcoma is extremely unlikely. But as I said, it's possible. In this patient with beta thalassemia, the enlarged spleen was due to, well, you see a large spleen, liver looks okay, there's bony changes, which are the typical changes in beta thalassemia. Now, patients with beta thalassemia get extramedullary hematopoiesis. And you can see on the sagittal views at the very edge at the bottom, there are soft tissue densities in the presacral space, and that really is extramedullary hematopoiesis. This is not lymphoma. Yes, you can get lymphoma in any patient, and a big spleen is one of the findings, but usually there's focal lesions, but there doesn't need to be. Portal hypertension, patient has a big spleen, but this is not really the appearance of portal hypertension. This is not sickle cell disease. I already told you it's thalassemia. Sickle cell, you get a fish mouth vertebral body. And most patients with, thick, with sickle cell disease, the spleen is going to be small and often autoinfarcted. This was a great case because at PATH, they did remove the spleen. This was extramedullary hematopoiesis. Again, that occurs in the nodal regions, periodic, in the chest and the abdomen, but also can occur in the spleen, can occur in the liver, can occur in the kidneys, and even in the adrenal glands. The best diagnosis in this case is, well, when we look at the axial images, it looks like the esophagus is dilated with some food matter. But if you look at the sagittal view, you realize it's really an outpouching from the esophagus. It's upper third of esophagus and has food or fluid matter present. I don't see free air. This is not a perforation. Esophageal cancer, I guess, theoretically, if you had a distal cancer and it caused obstruction, that's a possibility. Esophagitis, usually it's wall thickening. I guess if you had severe esophagitis at GE junction, it would obstruct higher up. But when you look at this and you look at all the images, this is an outpouching, perfect location, perfect appearance for a Zenker's diverticulum. A really nice example. In this patient postpartum with an acute abdomen, the most likely diagnosis is, first of all, let me just say that we scan a reasonable number of patients postpartum, particularly patients with C-sections, but usually is to look for complications of bleeding, for example. But in this case, it's not bleeding we see, it's the liver, multiple low density lesions in the liver, which in some sense look like infarcts perhaps, and in some sense look like bleeding. What gives you that? Well, there is blood present, so there is a liver bleed. That would be an answer A. It's not an abscess. And yes, there's some blood in the abdomen, so abdominal bleed, the liver's in the abdomen. That's not a wrong answer. But the answer in a postpartum patient with low density, with bleeding in the liver, you got to think about HELP syndrome, which occurs postpartum or sometimes prepartum with liver bleed and infarction. Those are the L's in HELP syndrome. Very important. Just a couple comments to make on this case. When we talk about hepatic bleeds, we talk about hepatoma, or hepatic adenoma usually is the most common thing. 
We mention other tumors, FNH, hemangiomas, METs, which are exceedingly rare. We talk about connective tissue disease, polyarthritis nodosa, but then you see small aneurysms in the kidneys, as well as potentially in the liver, though the liver is less frequent, theoretically infectious disease, but right up there is help. And help is always at the prepartum or postpartum state in patients. Uh, often these patients have complex pregnancies. Uh, many of those patients have had C-sections, so something to think about. This is a great case, and I picked this case because I have to admit I had not seen this, and when I quizzed people, most of them had not seen it. The foreign body near the cervix is, and you see something which looks like, almost looks like a tube, then you look at it, it looks like a cup. Okay, so it's an unexplained foreign body, but that's if you don't recognize what it is, it's unexplained. It's not an IUD, and it's not a pessary. Pessaries are usually ring shape. This is a menstrual cup. Many patients are now using menstrual cup. It's supposed to be environmentally friendly. Uh, you can see it sitting there. It's a U-shape, a very nice example. So the next time you see it, don't scratch your head. No, it's a menstrual cup. On this coronary CTA, the best diagnosis is, now of course you only have two images, and what you're basically looking at is the patient's LAD. And the LAD has calcified and non-calcified plaque, and especially in the proximal aspect of the vessel that looks like significant disease. So the best diagnosis, yes, there's plaque. That's a reasonable diagnosis. There's no motion-related artifact. There's no photon drop-off. But here it looks like the LAD is occluded. That's more than simply saying LAD plaque. And that indeed is the right answer. This patient was eventually stented. The best diagnosis of the patient with right lower quadrant pain is, when you look at the axial images, right in the middle of the image is a big soft tissue mass that's fat attenuation compared to the uh, sub-Q fat or the intra-abdominal fat. It's about 4 cm. Where is it? It's in the colon. You can see it really nicely when you look at the coronal view. Now, this is a lipoma. You can see the right colon is kind of intersuscepted upward. This lipoma actually began in the region of the patient's cecum, and then it intersuscepted and went to the mid-transverse colon. So yes, the diagnosis is there's lipoma in the colon. It's not colon cancer. It is a polyp. By definition, anything is a polyp, but it's not really a polyp. It's a lipoma, but it's not just a lipoma. It's a lipoma with intersusception. So a really great case. And with that, I've now shown you 10 cases. I hope you got them all right. But really what I hope you did is learn something, think about cases, think about some unusual things you're going to see in practice. And hopefully next time you see one of these findings, you're going to make the right diagnosis. And with that, have a great day. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.